there's going to be a new baby within the family. It's not a PlayStation 3. Okay. <laughs> Sony Computer Entertainment will be launching new handheld entertainment platform in 2004. The name of this new platform is called PSP. Yes, PlayStation Portable. PSP is this basic platform. A world where all kinds of entertainment, like games, music, movies, are going to be fused together. The Walkman of the 21st century. It may be the most addictive toy in history, and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas. Nintendo video games. They first arrived from Japan uh, three years ago, and now millions of American kids are hooked and mesmerized. When they do stop to talk, it's in a language only they understand. Nintendo spent a vast majority of their early years dominating the video game market. And while they did see some comparable competition in Sega when it came to home console units, Nintendo had a nearly 100% hold on the portable space. From the start of 1980 all the way to the early 2000s, there was essentially no competition that was able to make any meaningful push towards Nintendo. The Game & Watch was Nintendo's first real major success in the game's business, and that led to the original Game Boy, which quickly became a household name. Nintendo didn't rest on any laurels either, the Game Boy Color came along to invigorate sales, then the true successor, Game Boy Advance. But as Nintendo felt a cool breeze of success in the handheld space, Sony was soon becoming a major player in the video game market with the PlayStation, a console which inherently would not have existed without Nintendo to begin with. Nintendo was originally going to partner with Sony for a CD-ROM drive add-on for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, which would be called PlayStation. Nintendo then backed out of that deal without telling Sony and instead partnered with Philips, which was announced at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1991. Sony then attempted to continue working on a game's platform with Sega, but they also swiftly denied any partnership. And while at the time, Sony CEO Norio Oga was initially skeptical about getting involved in video games, this betrayal is what led to Sony going ahead with developing the PlayStation on their own. And sure enough, come 1994 and beyond, the PlayStation saw meteoric success finally giving Nintendo intense pressure in the home console market, and pretty much forcing Sega out of hardware entirely. Then comes the early 2000s, where the PlayStation 2 launches, and easily becomes one of the most sought-after consumer electronics. At this point, Nintendo and soon Microsoft are doing what they can to find their place in the home console market, but Nintendo is still comfortably enjoying success with portables by launching the Game Boy Advance in 2001, which sees strong sales and consumer interest. Game Boy Advance, console quality gaming anywhere. However, the world is left wondering when Sony will make a true portable PlayStation. Sony only dabbled slightly in releasing the Pocket Station in 1999, which was more of an add-on peripheral to the original PlayStation. It functioned as a memory card that could also display additive content for certain games. It sold quite well with over 5 million units, but was only released in Japan. It never quite made it anywhere else due to Sony not being able to keep up with demand. But with PS1 and 2 doing so well, it seemed natural for everyone to expect that Sony should release a handheld. And rumors amongst the video game industry seemed sure that was indeed what Sony was up to. It was more a matter of, when is it going to come? What is it going to look like? Can Sony translate their home console success into a bite-sized experience? Can another company finally come in and offer a real alternative to Nintendo handhelds? Sony finally announces development of a portable gaming device at E3 2003. The name of this new platform is called PSP. Yes, PlayStation Portable. It's simple. <laughs> the baby is in the incubator at the moment, and <laughs> even the father of the baby, I can bring him out of the incubator. But as a family member, he has the same DNA. PSP is a disc-based platform, same as PlayStation and the PlayStation 2. He is the Walkman of the 21st century. PSP, the Walkman of the 21st century. 
Most journalists attending the conference did not even expect such an informal announcement of Sony's new portable, but most were incredibly impressed with the details SCE President and CEO Ken Kutaragi shared. The device would use a miniature optical disc called UMD, short for Universal Media Disc. They would be able to hold up to 1.8 gigabytes of data while being less than half the size of a standard CD or DVD. This was an incredible feat for its time, not only due to its size and storage capacity, but also that they were going to be used outside of games. PSP would support MPEG-4 and other unannounced codecs with DVD image quality. Ken Kutaragi was also keen on pointing out the security of UMD. Along with the latest security system, will be employed to prevent piracy. It's very important. The portable was also described as having near PS2 quality graphics, being powered by a 90 nanometer semiconductor technology and a MIPS 32-bit core. The device would feature a 4.5-inch backlit display, include 3D sound, and have a button layout similar to current DualShock controllers. The memory stick would be utilized for game storage, and the system would run on a rechargeable lithium-ion battery. The biggest promise, however, was connectivity. PSP would be able to connect to your computer, your PS2, and of course other PSP systems for multiplayer games. The conference closed out with no physical hardware being shown, but a promise that the PSP would be the all-in-one portable device you'll want to take everywhere with you. Thank you very much for attending this meeting. Enjoy E3. Enthusiasm is high in the gaming community. Despite no hardware being shown, the description of the device plants it far ahead of anything else available in terms of graphics and multimedia function. And with Sony having such a strong hold in the home console market, many are certain that the PSP, whatever it turns out to look like, is probably going to be a huge success. About six months later is when the world would get their first look at the PSP, when Sony holds a corporate strategy meeting in early November. Most of the meeting is focused on Sony Corp's overall strategy, and not necessarily PlayStation or PSP for that matter, but concept images of the PSP were released. And the early images were slightly concerning in that it appeared all the buttons were flat and completely flush with the surface of the system. It also looked as though there was no analog stick present. The back, however, looked pretty standard, featuring the UMD drive and a chrome ring accent. Thankfully, these were just concept images subject to change, because it wouldn't be until E3 2004 where the PSP has its formal announcement and reveal. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the latest addition to the PlayStation family. PSP is officially demonstrated on stage during Sony's 2004 E3 press conference. The portable is sleek and compact with a glossy black finish. It's visually stunning and tantalizing to the room. SCEA President and CEO Kaz Harai opens the PSP presentation by discussing the overall proposal and goal of PSP. At the time, E3 was more of a trade show for retailers and investors, to better understand how the product will fit in the current market and how successful it can potentially be. Kaz went over the target demographic of PSP, which would mainly focus on males aged 18 to 35 with disposable income. He mentions that PSP will feature a wide array of peripherals that will be sold separately, and spends a portion of the show discussing UMD video, demonstrating the unit playing a trailer for the upcoming movie Spider-Man 2. However, Kaz made it very clear that games were the killer app for PSP, and played a scissor reel of upcoming games that the world can expect. With games like Need for Speed, Ape Escape, Metal Gear Acid, Wipeout, Tiger Woods, Ridge Racer, and so much more, it was now abundantly clear PSP was absolutely going to deliver on its promise of PS2 quality games on the go. Sony even displays a chart outlining worldwide developer support. He then goes on to invite EA Worldwide Studios president Don Matrick to the stage to discuss EA's support of the system. Since the launch of the PlayStation 1, 
SCEA and Electronic Arts have formed one of the most powerful partnerships in the entertainment industry. And Sony has always understood it's all about great software. When PlayStation Portable debuts next year, EA will provide the same degree of support that we gave the PlayStation 2. We've committed the resources and the people to make the PlayStation Portable a huge success. PSP was surely going to be a very desirable piece of kit, with most fears and concerns amongst gamers now being dashed away. The system looks great, the games deliver on the graphics performance, UMD will allow for movies on the go and a smaller form factor compared to standard portable DVD players, and the wireless technology gives the assurance that the system is future-proofed. Nearly 100 developers are on board, ready to give the PSP the software it needs to thrive. It's no surprise that gamers are pumped, especially during this moment in which Nintendo is also revealing their new portable hardware, the Nintendo DS, which by PSP standards was underpowered and underpromised. Sony pulled out all the punches with PSP, and DS just came out as lacking in the public view. Even more so when Nintendo clarifies the DS was not meant to be a successor to the Game Boy Advance, but rather live on the market with it side by side. To consumers, PlayStation was the place to play, and with Nintendo now seemingly offering a handheld that doesn't even come remotely close to what PSP is promising, everyone started to write off Nintendo and the DS. It was all hands on deck for the portable PlayStation. I think the main focus of the PSP is gaming, with the uh, outstanding graphics capability. Wi-Fi capability will enhance the gameplay, particularly the ad hoc mode will be very uh, immersive, so that kind of the new experience will create a new lifestyle by using the PSP. PSP is a kind of the uh, entertainment lifeline, so whenever you go out, uh, I think they uh, uh, must have uh, the PSP with them. On October 27, 2004, Sony reveals their launch date and plans for the PSP in Japan. The platform would launch on December 12th that year and offer two bundles, a base model that costs 19,800 yen, which at the time with conversion rates puts the system at around $185. There would also be a value pack that includes some extra peripherals, and this would be priced at 24,800 yen, or around $232. Come December, PSP officially launches in Japan and does very well, selling over 200,000 units on the first day. By February 2005, Sony announces their North America launch plans, only offering the value pack at a higher price than expected, $249. It was slated for release on March 24th, and by the end of the 25th, Sony sold over half a million PSP systems. There's the PSP. Oh, they're counting it down. Six, five, four, three. Two, one, it's midnight, folks. A European launch was delayed until September 1st due to high demand in North America and Japan. But once PSP did launch, it sold close to a million units across Europe in the first week, shattering sales records that were just set not that long ago by the recently released Nintendo DS, which was seeing great success as well. Nintendo had a lot going for it in that the DS launched at a much lower price, up to $100 less than most territories compared to the PSP. But direct comparisons aside, both handhelds were doing very well, and it was looking like PSP was going to find its place in the handheld market once dominated entirely by Nintendo. Gamers were really enjoying the launch titles and really experimenting with the multimedia capabilities of it, so much so that hackers took great interest in the device, quickly discovering exploits in the PSP that could be explored to run unsigned code. By June 15th, 2005, cracked code of the PSP was distributed online. In retaliation, Sony sent out new firmware updates that not only closed existing exploits, but included brand new substantial features. One of the earliest updates was the addition of a web browser, a great feature to have, but at the same time also removed major vulnerabilities in the PSP. This would only be the start to Sony's rampant back and forth with hackers to keep the PSP secure. 
Well, I, I think the UMD will be successful because of the content that's on it. I think the media device is important in terms of, you know, what's the, the memory capacity, what, what are the technical specs of it in terms of bringing content on it. But if there's compelling content, then people will put content on that. And I think, you know, it's going to be a chicken and egg thing. We put a lot of hardware out there because it's got great software support on UMD, so the hardware is successful. The hardware is successful, so other forms of media become interested uh, in being part of the uh, PSP success and then movie content comes over. So um, I think it's one of those things where you create a format that has the ability to put great software on it. People put great software on it. The format's successful. The, uh, the media is successful. During all of 2005 and going into 2006, Sony was now dealing with the PlayStation 3, their latest home console, which was struggling to impress with obscure architecture, a high price tag, and strong competition from Microsoft with the Xbox 360. But Sony still spends some time highlighting the PSP and what's to come. During E3 2006, Kazurai gives updated sales figures, with PSP shipping over 17 million units worldwide as of March 31st, 2006. Hardware is certainly doing well, but software sales are at 47 million units worldwide implying that PSP owners are only buying, on average, two to three games over that two-year period since launch. Kaz also points out that UMD video sales in the US are around 18 million units. With US PSP hardware sales being around 8 million, UMD video is also showing pretty low engagement. As the show presses forward, upcoming PSP games are shown, and the greatest hits line is announced for PSP. The rest of the event is for PlayStation 3. We have shown you that PlayStation 3 is the most advanced computer entertainment system in the world, designed for games, as well as to manage a myriad of entertainment content and network services. The DS, on the other hand, starts to lead the way with massive sales and compelling software, still proving that Nintendo has its place in the handheld market. Yet it's not all doom and gloom for the PSP, as its first two years still saw numerous firmware updates delivering new features to the XMB, and consistent releases of console-quality games, like Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, Wipeout Pure, Me and My Katamari, Loco Roco, SOCOM, Daxter, Siphon Filter, Metal Gear Solid, Death Jr., Tony Hawk, and so much more. In essence, the PSP was doing almost everything right, except behind the scenes, where Sony is struggling to stay on top of every new exploit that is being discovered within the PSP's code. Hackers were now finding ways to downgrade PSP firmwares to make old exploits usable. There was also a Trojan horse being circulated online, which would potentially remove crucial files from the PSP. While many hackers openly voiced that they did not support piracy, their online circulating homebrew was opening the floodgates to it. It then becomes a cat and mouse game between Sony and homebrew enthusiasts. There were five to six firmware updates annually that were clearing up new exploits found in every new PSP update. It was starting to look like this was a battle that Sony may not be able to win. What I'm holding in my hand is the latest version of PSP, which will become available worldwide this year in September. Now, from a distance, this PSP might not look very much different from the current model. It still has a brilliant 4.3 inch uh, LCD screen. It still has, obviously, the convenience of UMD. But when you have it in your hand, the difference becomes quite clear. Sony gave the PSP some much needed attention during E3 2007 by giving the portable a new, slim, updated form factor. The PSP 2000 is now 33% lighter and 19% slimmer, with an improved battery life and increased loading times for UMD. The highlight feature is a new video out port, so the display could be transferred to a TV. Sony then demonstrates more upcoming titles that included a lot of heavy hitter IP like God of War and Siphon Filter. Closing out the PSP portion, Jack Tratton announces new bundle packs and an exclusive Star Wars colorway to coincide with Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron. Thank you for joining us here today, Chewie. I know you've come a long way, and I see you have the, uh, the new Star Wars Battlefront PSP Entertainment Pack which comes bundled with the PSP exclusive game from LucasArts, Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron. By July 2007, prolific PSP hacker Dark Alex announces he is officially leaving the custom firmware scene and ceasing operation of his website. This was a shocking revelation to the PSP community as Dark Alex contributed so much in terms of custom firmwares and downgrades. He cited that the time required for his work was just too much and that he was concerned for his liability when Sony was showing extreme hostility towards hackers on PS3. He says, I think it is better to leave now rather than end paying the consequences. 
His departure pretty much killed the PSP hacking ventures for a while until HBL came in, which was an open source software project for loading homebrew on PSP in a manner where it doesn't support official games. Created by Mosquito and AB5000, Half Byte Loader became the new way to toy around with your PSP and had many iterations among exploits discovered in games like Medal of Honor Heroes and Pat Upon 2's demo. As time pressed forward, it seemed that while the PSP was doing just fine, the DS was doing much better. What was initially being written off as an inferior platform is now trouncing the PSP easily in nearly every market. By the end of 2007, DS sales were at 64 million units worldwide, whereas PSP was around 35 million. But come 2008, things turn up a bit for the handheld when Monster Hunter Portable 2nd G comes out in Japan. Monster Hunter single-handedly sells hundreds of thousands of PSPs in one week to beat DS sales. During E3 2008, PSP gets little mention with a new bundle being announced and the reveal of Resistance Retribution. A welcomed announcement, but at the time, Sony is clearly focused on improving the PlayStation 3. To keep the PSP momentum going, Sony announces another revision of the PSP in August 2008 during the German Games Convention. PSP 3000 has a new brighter LCD with a wider range of colors. It also has an anti-reflective display for better outdoor use, and all the logos, buttons, and UMD tray were redesigned. A microphone was added as well, and the video outport could now display through component or composite. The redesigned PSP released in October and was criticized for objects in motion on screen to have a slight interlaced effect being very visible. Sony responded by saying it was on a hardware level and couldn't be remedied with a software update, essentially not acknowledging that it would ever be fixed. We're on our way to an undisclosed secret location escorted by Sony Computer Entertainment Security to meet the newest member of the PlayStation family. With the formal announcement at this year's E3, everyone wants to get their hands on the new PSP Go. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We just don't know where yet. Thanks for coming. Have a seat. I think there's something here you might want to take a look at. Is all that really necessary? We've got top secret information. Are you ready? I am. Welcome to Mama. Wow, it's so tiny. It's so much smaller. Sony's digital magazine Core reveals the new radically changed PSP Go. However, the magazine notes that the unit was revealed at E3, which was still actually a few weeks out at the time. Sony evidently by accident let their big secret out early, including new game announcements for Gran Turismo, Little Big Planet, Jack and Daxter, and another Metal Gear Solid. Once E3 2009 rolls around, Kaz Harai brings us the expected. And I have it right here in my pocket. Here it is. We actually have uh, a couple of names for this beautiful little device. First, we call it the worst kept secret of E3. And we call it PSP Go. The PSP Go is a digital only device completely removing the UMD drive and instead opting for 16 gigabytes of onboard memory for downloading content from the PlayStation Store. It's a lot smaller and more pocketable with its sliding mechanism, and Sony is clearly testing the waters with this device as they aim to step back from UMD to be more in control of the content being sold. The new handheld would live alongside the PSP 3000 and not be a full replacement, but it comes at a premium as it launches October 1st at a steep $249. With no UMD conversion plan in place, and Sony promising that most older UMD titles will be available for download, it's a tough pill for most consumers to swallow, and predictably, the new redesign doesn't sell very well. In 2010, UMD Movie is essentially dead, with no new movies coming out, and retailers having long pulled their stock off the shelves. The movie initiative was by and large a failure, which Sony likely knew anyway as they began to focus PSP on being a more connected platform with downloading games and working wirelessly with the PS3. During E3 2010, Sony still gives the PSP some much needed attention by showing off a new ad campaign that follows the same successful format that's currently being used with the PS3. What is your uh, greatest strength? Sniping. Greatest weakness? Work too hard, always running up the scoreboard. <laughs> How many games are there in the PSP library? Over 500. Name the best PSP game under $10. SoCon, Fireteam Bravo. Favorite snack? I consume a healthy amount of suckers online every day. Ah, like that answer. When you first contacted me, I was just going to ignore you, but you showed me something today. You're hired. You start on Monday. All right. Nice to know, my brother. Okay, I'll see you Monday. I'll bring bagels. 
God of War Ghost of Sparta is then teased, and a new scissor reel highlights all the great games coming to PSP. Even though Sony still spends most of their efforts on PS3, their PSP support is still there. At the time it was being overshadowed by the PS3, and a lot of PSP content went unnoticed. 2010 ends strong for the portable, however, with Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, which once again helps the handheld outsell the DS easily for months in Japan. It's at this point though where PSP begins to show its age. With sales slowing down and gamers just not showing much interest, rumors have already started about a next generation handheld from Sony, and discussions soon become a matter of when the PSP will die and when Sony will announce the successor. 2011 would be that year, when Sony holds a meeting on January 27th in Japan where they officially unveil NGP the next generation portable, which would later be called PlayStation Vita. With the new handheld sporting two analog sticks, a touchscreen, a rear touchpad, and near PS3 quality visuals, the PSP is easily forgotten. Sony makes one last PSP revision announcement during Gamescom 2011 called PSP Street, which is a lower entry model that was never released outside of PAL territories. It sported a matte black finish and lacked Wi-Fi or the microphone. PSP Go has now been discontinued, and all mention of PSP in most Sony feeds is now gone. And while PS Vita took the limelight during its launch in late 2011, PSP continued to be sold and supported by Sony, as is tradition with most of Sony's hardware transitions. PSP shipments officially end in June 2014, ending a nearly 10-year life cycle, with over 80 million units sold worldwide. The PlayStation Store for PSP closed on March 31st, 2016, and UMD production ended a few months later. Hey everyone, Ryan here. Thank you so much for watching yet another one of my documentaries. I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, these are passion projects of mine. I love doing these. They're a lot of fun. But as I often mention, they take a very long time to make. I'm a one-man show on this YouTube channel. All the editing, research, voiceover, scripts, all that stuff, it's all done uh, just by me. So as I often say, uh, any support over at patreon.com slash mysticryan would be greatly appreciated. We'll keep doing more of these documentaries as always, but hopefully I can do them in a more timely manner than say every two, three months. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now, but we will still keep doing more of them. And as always, any other support's greatly appreciated. Share the video around, send it to a friend, uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already for the best PlayStation news reviews and updates that are here on YouTube. And I think that's pretty much it for our housekeeping. So uh, I will see you all in my next video. And as always, you take it easy.